Hi guys, Ashley here. Today I'm bringing you Arnold Ma, the founder of Cumin. And we're going to talk about China, modern Chinese consumers, what's happening with the whole coronavirus outbreak and how to manage our marketing teams, plans, and essentially prepare for the recovery. Arnold, welcome on the show. Thank you, Ashley. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored. Uh, it's phenomenal to have you all the way from London right now. Tell me, first of all, how is everything going in London? What's up? Um, you know, it's crazy times, right? It's like uh, one of those things uh, that we've no one, not many people have really experienced before. I guess no one's really experienced before and completely unprecedented. Um, unprecedented. Um, so I think everyone's just really confused. Um, the mm. government is, I think having a really good grip on the society right now. They're closing down things very slowly rather than the kind of very abrupt approach that China and the rest of Europe has taken, which I think actually works better for the UK because people are not used to that kind of authoritarian government. Um, so I actually think Boris Johnson is doing a good job by kind of doing it really slowly. So starting off by closing the schools and then closing restaurants, allowing takeaways, and then eventually slowly closing them all together and now he's saying that people shouldn't be, we should be social distancing and should only be going out for essentials and, and definitely not be meeting your friends. Um, so I think the gradual approach is really good and it gets people slowly used to it. Um, but I think in general, it's, I guess it's similar to the rest of the world. Everyone mm. is just really confused working from home and getting, to, get, getting used to a new way of working. I love it. It's already basically the first two minutes uh, of our chat and it's already a different perspective. I've spoken with so many people that tell Boris Johnson is a complete, um, <laughs> yeah, interesting person because he right now is basically not acting fast enough because people are potentially getting infected while attending schools, restaurants, etc. And you are saying that from where you stand, it actually makes a lot of sense because people feel more comfortable with that transition. So beautiful, beautiful um, addition to the conversation. Thank you so much. I know that you work with both a British team members and also mainland Chinese team members. How are you uh, right now managing this, first of all, diverse cultures, remote work, everybody has their anxieties. How has your team basically coped with that so far? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I think everyone, everyone reacts to this differently, right? And that's what makes us awesome. Some people are genuinely worried, whereas other people are kind of like, maybe not worried enough. And, <laughs> and I think I'm probably one of the, I'm probably in that camp. And I think in general, we just basically try to create an environment where everyone can communicate with each other as much as possible. But you, you know, when you work from home, right, you lose a benefit of instant communication which is what you have in the office. I could tap you on the shoulder if I was in the same office with you and mm -hmm. ask you a question, I would get a response. When you're working from home, you don't get that. So what we try to do is just create structures around uh, touch points. So we have a meeting every day. We talk about daily actions um, with different departments. We have mm -hmm. WeChat groups and WhatsApp groups. Uh, with, again, with different project teams, different departments. So I think it's all about communication, working from home. Um, and in some aspects, I know a lot of people talk about it from a benefit perspective, and I think there are a lot of benefits because you get to focus on what you're doing, you don't have distractions. But I think the downside of working from home is the kind of like, uh, it, 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 it's a, a teamworking environment, right? Like you lose mm. the communication, you lose the creativity and the idea generation you get just from talking to people and even being in the same room as people. Um, and that's what we try to kind of facilitate as much as possible with like Zoom, which is what we're using now, uh, and with these kind of like messenger groups that we have as well. Right, uh, absolutely agree. And in China, they went even step further after six weeks of quarantine. They started the virtual clubbing, virtual uh, get togethers, oh virtual parks, uh, cl you, you know, the cloud clubbing, cloud dancing, yep. cloud learning, cloud whatever. It was uh, quite incredible. And right now, I actually saw that a couple of Western bloggers start the concerts, start the dancing parties online where all the celebrities are joining. <laughs> joining. So it's very, very interesting. Um, in terms of the um, marketing perspective, because you are in marketing, you are leading one of the biggest um, marketing companies focused on China in the UK. So what do you see your clients, other brands, organizations, how do they react to the current outbreak within mainland China? Are they frozen? Are they prepared? Are they holding their marketing budgets? Are they revising their strategies? What's the sentiment? 
Uh, again, really good question. I think, again, like, like people, every brand is different and people, people are reacting to this in very strange ways. I think some people, in fact, majority of the brands are like pausing their marketing spans. Uh, they're like, you know, we, we're uncertainty, we're, we're with uncertainty and we don't know what's going to happen in the future. It's best to just lay low, uh, just fast to lay low and see what happens. Um, but some of our clients and, and these are the ones that I really respect because they're the ones that are, are brave enough to try something in times of crisis. And you know, those people will get the most benefit and the most reward. Like my personal opinion is that now really is not the time to not do anything because a, you are able to get ahead of everyone else by doing something because a lot of people are pausing their activities are pausing their marketing span, they're pausing their marketing campaigns and b brands genuinely out of all the other times that they try to create a social good, they can actually do something that, that is actually a social good element. They can help people. They can genuinely create a situation where they could help people. Um, a lot of brands are doing this. So Pret is doing really well. Um, Allbirds, the shoe brand, is doing really well. They're giving away like free trainers to everyone in the NHS. Um, and a lot of different brands like Brewdog, uh, a pub chain in the UK is doing really well. You know mm. about LVMH making hand sanitizers probably the ugliest products they've ever made in the history of the brand. It doesn't matter, right? Because they're helping people. And, mm -hmm. and people will remember that when this is all over because it will be over and we will bounce back. People will remember all these great things that these brands did to help the world and the society and, 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 and the situation. Absolutely. I actually recently saw a hashtag by one of the influencers in the digital marketing space saying that uh, she proposes to boycott all of the brands that are not supporting in one way or the other, the um, either consumers wow. or governments or whatever. I was like, wow, this is, this is a brave ask, but I do understand where this is coming from. And you know how in China, the moment the whole um, you know, thing cut loose, a lot of big uh, tech companies also stepped up, right? Alibaba donated exactly the amount the Chinese government donated to Hubei, which is huge, right? And obviously Tencent yeah. and JD and all these companies, including even smaller brands and actually international brands and international conglomerates, while they donated some money, some masks, some equipment, some, um, uh, as you said, hand sanitizers, uh, sanitizers they were uh, somewhat criticized within mainland China, especially social media. You know how strong social media users are in mainland China. They really like finding all the dirty uh, kind of uh, clothes in your uh, wardrobe. And they started criticizing. They started saying, okay, this yeah. little brand from China, they donated that much and they did that much. And you've been benefiting from China market for so many years and your business is so big, <laughs> but you're only supporting us basically with some peanuts. What's your take on that? I think it's a very dangerous territory with China. Chinese, you know, Chinese people are very sensitive, very nationalistic. So <laughs> I think unless you're 100% sure what you're doing is, is selfless, then th th there's no reason to do it. But if you are, if what you are doing as a brand is genuinely selfless, then it's okay to be criticized because at the end of the day, it's, it's what you can do and it's what you're willing to, it's, it's what you, it's what you're willing to do for, for, for China, then you, you know, you're not going to please everyone, right? You're always going to have critics. So I think, I think, yeah, just do what you can, but be true to yourself. So rather than trying to do something that will benefit your brand, try to do something that you genuinely think will help the situation. Being authentic. And people can see, mm. sorry, I was going to say, people can really see through that authenticity as well. And mm. uh, it's, there's no way to hide these days. Uh, absolutely. I totally agree with that. Um, in terms of your professional recommendation, um, let's say there are brands out there in the market and many of them are right now not sure whether, you know, China is sort of coming back and many of the big cities are sort of back to normal in many ways. Um, so people are wondering, shall I right now start, you know, revising my plan, investing into that market or shall I still hold on or shall I basically enter China, exit China, what to do? So what would be your professional recommendations for a mid-sized brand, let's say, that is present in China, but they are trying to be more present and essentially capture more opportunities? I think, uh, <laughs> and I say this with 
with every full intention of following up is that I think every single brand, if China is important to you, and importance is, is a key word here, China needs to be a priority. If China is important to you, you should, you should really look into what you can do now. And uh, so we do the daily news on LinkedIn and a lot of the numbers we're seeing is that pretty much every single industry aside from a few few that, uh, of them are already bouncing back and the numbers are crazy from the consumer perspective. So we're seeing like uplifts in certain industries like health and fitness, uh, in luxury, even like shopping as well. Uh, we're seeing uplifts in um, uh, what was it, travel as well actually. So there was a survey did a survey that happened recently. I think it was like 15,000 people were surveyed in 30 different cities and pretty much uh, most of them said that they would be willing to travel in May uh, and they'll be willing to spend a lot of money. Um, so I think all the industries are bouncing back and people on the, on the back of the quarantine and isolation, people are now willing to spend and willing to essentially almost like um, catch, up, uh, catch up, I guess, on consumerism. Uh, so I think now is a really good time to create your China entry strategy. And you probably know this as well, Alexander Wan, I think opened yeah. the Timo store on the 20th of March. So yeah. that's an example of brand uh, now looking at the opportunity and uh, saying like, look, let's do something now because now is the time. Absolutely. And I've heard a couple of people talking about the disruption of cross-border e-commerce brands, because right now when the rest of the world goes on lockdown, it's not that you don't want to capture China opportunity. It's just that your employees per se uh, in your warehouses or whatever other service staff are not there. So you can't be physically um, ready for what's to come. Um, what could they do if you are right now from the global perspective facing all those uncertainties? Is China still on the map? Do, do they still need a plan? Um, yeah, so what we're looking to do is potentially testing out with a lot of our brands right now, especially cross-border e-commerce. So cross-border e-commerce is getting much, much better and more convenient in China. So we're doing a combination of essentially like... Um, uh, content collaboration with creators in China, uh, so mm -hmm. mixture of live streaming and content, and then the idea is to build a brand brand awareness and then to create a desire for their products or demand for their products. Uh, so without really investing too much into creating a Chinese um, logistics and e-commerce solution, like cross, you can you can try anything with cross border. So my my advice would be, don't build the shop, build the demand, and mm -hmm. then build the shop once you have the demand. Mm -hmm. And building the demand, right now we all know that the big word and the big focus goes into basically two areas. One is live streaming. Everything <laughs> is live streaming. I mean, Wei Tao, which is a part of Alibaba's ecosystem, is all um, focused on the community within this e-commerce platform, um, powered by bloggers, by live shows. It reminds me of uh, those, you know, uh, 1990s TV advertising shows where they would show you a pen and then they twist it and turn it and say, just now, only for you, two come for one, etc. And the second one, uh, big focus of a lot of marketers in China is the KOCs, uh, micro influencers, basically building your own private pools. Apart from these two, is there anything else people need to know, people need to focus on, people really need to understand and start acting on? Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, yeah, those those two are definitely the priority. Um, I think you've articulated them, articulated them really well. And I think the third thing that we found works really well, especially for brands that are looking to target a specific subculture, right? So let's say you are a sneaker brand trying to get into this skating culture, right? Um, so what I would what I would advise them to do, and we've tried this with some of our clients, it worked really well. Is instead of going to influencers or KOCs, or kind of your consumers. Um, we would actually approach people who are skaters um, and they might not have like massive social media following, uh, but the content they create is very authentic. So again, on the back of building demand, we try to create collaborations be uh, between these kind of like, I guess, these creators in certain subcultures and the brands. Uh, and then we create content from the brand's perspective featuring these people. So you won't get the reach, but you get the authenticity. So in order to get the reach, what you could do is uh, run social media paid uh, with, with, with social media ad, ad products. Uh, there's a few benefits in doing that as well, because social media platforms, I know some of the Chinese platforms now have like 
uh, KOL products, but they still prefer you spending money on the ad tech because they make the most money and they don't make as much money from secondary transfers, whether it's official mm. or not. Uh, so when you spend on ad tech, um, not only do you get, I think, better value for your money, but you can also optimize it live, almost like every single pound you spend if you have to. Uh, and combining that with the authentic authenticity of the content, what you should be really doing is that every penny you invest is creating a community for your future kind of demand generation. So that's something that we found that worked really well. And I think globally, we're moving away from this kind of like Instagram influencer culture to a more authentic creator mm. culture. Um, mm. Yeah. I absolutely agree with you. And actually, to your point on ads, we've been... Um, basically very surprised to see that when we did advertising for some of our clients uh, beginning of this year, the platform gave us free traffic. And in some yeah. cases, it was up to basically double. Let's say I paid for, let's say, a million people reach. But because of the you know, current situation and platform genuinely trying to support you, they give you another 100% on top of that double of free traffic. And it doesn't matter whether you work with WeChat or you work with platforms like Keep, uh, which is all about fitness and stuff. Basically, all of them are really trying to support businesses. So advertising is definitely a good, um, good strategy. And to your point of you know, selling cross-border right now, actually, a lot of platforms, as you definitely know, have right now, uh, such as, for example, Tmall Global, JD Worldwide or whatever, they actually relaxed some of their rules. Uh, recently and international brands can for instance get verified because usually this is the most painful process for brands to be verified as you're yeah. being legitimate uh, um, you see it's been a long day <laughs> you, are, uh, <laughs> well, you can go onto this platform um, but right now they say that a few TV partners actually have the right to determine whether you can um, uh, you know, join the platform. And then they also get uh, easier access to live streaming. They have less free requ uh, requests, et cetera, et cetera. So it's becoming easier in many ways to do that, both through cross-border and also to essentially advertise and reach higher audiences. What's your take exactly. on sales campaigns? Because we mentioned that the demand is sort of in some markets is going up. So is sales campaign good now or is it naughty? Shall we go for it or not? Because I know that there are two camps of marketers, both within mainland China and outside mainland China that say that right now, uh, some of them say is a great time to sell. Others say no selling, build the community and you will send later on. What's your take? Um, can I sit on the fence? <laughs> um, I think... I think it depends on the product um, because certain industries spending from consumers are surging right now, whereas other industries are still in a relative kind of like, I guess, a sedentary mode. So if you're in those industries, if you're in health and fitness, if you're in luxury fashion, uh, you probably should be doing sales campaigns alongside your brand awareness campaigns. If you're in other industries that are not doing as well pre-coronavirus as some of the other industries, um, then you probably should be focusing on building loyalty and affinity. And like I said, really for brands right now is the best time to build loyalty because people remember, people remember what you did during times of crisis more than anything else. Um, so I think, yeah, sales, if you're in the right industry, but community building and affinity building for everyone else. I love it. And as you just now said, people remember what you did. I would like to talk about Chinese consumers. And you already mentioned that they are very nat uh, nationalistic and they, you know, they are very sophisticated. They know what they want. They're going to call you out. Uh, they have very high standards. They want you to be there 24 seven. They want highest quality <laughs> products, et cetera, et cetera. They are very picky as well. So what is your take on what's happening right now? Are the consumer preferences changing in a sustainable way, in a way that is going to be a long-term shift going forward after this coronavirus? Or is it just uh, something that happened and it's going to bounce right back? Yeah, I, I, I think 100% the long-term consumerism pattern will change in China. Mm. I, think, I think specifically, and, and this, is, um, this is very important because I think 
the health and fitness industry, we actually interviewed someone who was one of the first patient to be diagnosed with coronavirus in Wuhan. Yeah. Uh, and that was like a really insightful interview because, you know, you get a lot of like, uh, you, get, you get a lot of different things, different opinions in the news. But when you actually speak to someone who's experienced it as one of the first ones without the knowledge, without the benefit of knowledge that we have now, um, it's very enlightening. He was very positive about it. But the thing I took out the most is that he felt more than ever now, it's super important for us to stay healthy and stay fit. Uh, so that's mm-hmm. everything from exercising through to uh, eating well, uh, to physical, to mental health. So anyone in these industries, I think over the next 12 to 36 months is going to absolutely go nuts in China, right? Like it's already so big in Shanghai, but it's still nowhere near the scale that it is when you compare to London. Um, there's not enough, there's not enough classes and not enough fitness brands, not enough, um, active wear brands, uh, healthy eating. So like food brands, supplements, like all of these industries. Is going development to absolutely programs. Boom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's, yeah, men- mental health as well. All of these industries are going to boom in China. And I think if you're in one of these categories, you need to be looking at China right now because this is, this is opportunity when you look back and if you didn't take advantage of it, you're going to, <laughs> you're going to regret, you're going to be kicking yourself. That's beautiful. So imagine there is this brand in this category. What shall they be doing right now? What are the steps? If they are sitting there, they say, I'm ready. Um, I know that China has this, all these opportunities and the rest of the world is most likely not going to perform so well in the next half a year because of this global uh, situation. Uh, what is the checklist for them? Oh, that's, <laughs> that's a tough question. Um, How much money think- shall they prepare? Do they need a strategy? <laughs> um, yes, so I think, first of all, Set a budget. I think something that's right for the brand. Um, we normally say 10 to 20% of your first year's sales target. So however much you want to sell in China, you put 10 to 20% aside for marketing. Um, if you're a new brand, it's more in the 20% mark. If you're an existing brand, maybe get away with the 10% mark. Um, but I think start off just by, I genuinely think working with some creators, local creators in China, maybe some instructors, some health, uh, some health and fitness coaches, and start creating content. And I know you talk about short video a lot. I talk about short form video a lot. Start creating content, collaboration with kind of subculture opinion leaders uh, and start in your own Douyin account, your Kwai Show account, uh, and just start building an audience and community around your brand. That's not super expensive, um, but that's going to be invaluable when you're actually ready to sell to the audience. This is beautiful. Any last words on what do you expect to happen in the next three to six months? Sorry, one sec. I've got I've got a delivery man. <laughs> I'm just going to <laughs> No stress. I'm actually gonna keep it and I'm gonna fast stress speed it. So people are gonna absolutely love it. <laughs> I can't believe they're still delivering parcels, but <laughs> that's random. Um Yeah, so sorry, what was it? <laughs> the question was what is your take for the next three to six months? What is going to happen in the market? What's your prediction, obviously? Oh man, this is a tough question. <laughs> I like it. I like it. It's making me think. So I think, I think in the in Europe, in the West, we're still quite a way to go um, because I don't think we have the same level of control that China has implemented that's able to kind of like uh, I guess uh, slow this epidemic down fast enough for the economy to recover fast enough. Um, but I think in China, over the next three to six months, we're going to continually see things improve. I think business will start going back to normal. Because, you know, well, as soon as there is something in China, like uh, recently there was a lot of cases of people flying back to China, bringing the virus back. Uh, Lauren, uh, I know we both know her and she's a good friend of ours. Uh, she released a video recently of one of our staff going back. And you see, like, you see the contrast of how China is handling this. Like, it's, you know, it's like so, it's just... It's just so well organized, like from the minute you land to the minute that you get quarantined, like everything's just like super slick. There's just, you feel like there's no way this situation is going to get out of hand because they just have everything under control so well. So I think in China, um, the economy is definitely going to bounce back. As I mentioned earlier, those industries you're in, if you are mm-hmm. in those, now is the time to act in China. Maybe if you're pausing your campaigns and your marketing spend in the West, in the UK, you should think, in, think about redirecting some of that to China. And now is really the opportunity to test China, basically. Yeah. Um, I think over here, unless you have a genuine social good, 
uh, that you can commit to, to the society. That's not kind of like a, you know, like a PR stone or, or a selfish maneuver. You should do that. Uh, now is the time to act. And, um, and I guess that's, uh, <laughs> that's as much as I can come up with. <laughs> that's super exciting. And will there be, do you believe in the, I mean, you're based in the UK and uh, Europe in general. Do you believe that there will be a recovery in terms of tourists, in terms of international students coming from China this year? Basically, is there hope for the sector that's been hit the most? And in terms of how badly yeah. it was hit, I just want to share one um, number. And I live in Hong Kong, um, and we had February this year, basically a month ago, data released that year-on-year -year decrease in tourist population of Hong Kong is 96%. Okay, oh so that's how God. bad um, Hong Kong was hit. And obviously, um, the rest of the world is probably also doing quite badly. And most of the hotels around the world, when it comes to Chinese tourists, really have single digit occupancy, etc. So what's your take on Europe and the UK in general when it comes to the Chinese um, kind of outbound uh, travelers and international students? Um, I think definitely we'll recover this year. I think... Uh, it's similar to what's happening in China right now uh, is that once this situation is over and it will be um, eventually, I think hopefully in the next three to six months, people will almost be like itching to travel, right? Itching to buy, itching to travel, itching to do something because they've been quarantined for so long. They've been restrained for so long. Uh, I'm hoping that there will be a very, uh, a very short burst of boom after after the initial period and after everything is over uh, and then it'll start to kind of like pick up from there normalize but i'm very positive so i don't know <laughs> maybe, maybe you should take that with a pinch of salt <laughs> <laughs> ah, beautiful arnold thank you so much for taking the time it was absolutely phenomenal guys uh, please follow him on linkedin love his videos he's got all the channels he's got all the blogs if you're in the uk definitely get in touch meanwhile stay tuned for more videos to come soon Thank you, Ashley. Cheers.